we're going to put the cast of Vikings in the middle of a zombie outbreak. Everyone's together. You're all shooting a big ensemble scene. Everyone's on set. And then there's a zombie outbreak. I'm going to give you some character descriptions, and you need to tell me which actor best suits this description and why. Who is the most likely to be the very last person to catch on and not realize that there are zombies on set? I think that'd be Luisa, Luisa Richter. She'd probably be the last one to die because she wouldn't you know, even realize that there would be something happening and she'd just go about her life. She is so wonderful and she lives in this beautiful world that she fully occupies herself. Yeah, I think that would be her, absolutely. I love how you spun that into her surviving, because when I think of this question, I'm like, the last one to catch on is going to be the first one to get bitten, but like, you just gave her the edge there. Who is the most likely to sacrifice themselves for the group? Wow, that would probably be Leo. He's such a lovely man, and he's such, so generous, and he's always so willing to put everyone else's needs in front of others, and He's yeah, just an incredibly generous person to work with and to, to know as a friend. So he'd, he'd be our hero. All right, this one, I'm really curious to know your answer because I just watched an entire season of television where everyone's doing fantastic stunts nonstop. Who is the most likely to trip and fall while running from the zombies? Shall I maybe say Johannes? <laughs> but let me say that it's only because he's wearing this incredibly heavy cloak. Yeah exactly what I was thinking. I know, I'll definitely buy that. Mm -hmm. Who is the most likely to get bit and then try to hide their infection? Oh, that would be, absolutely be me. I'd be embarrassed and I, I always want to like, I don't want to be of trouble ever. So I'd probably be like, no, oh, I no, I just tripped. Like, it's fine. Nothing really happened. Like, don't worry about me, guys. I'll be fine. And then I'm like, my arm will like fall off and... Yeah, that would probably be me. <laughs> Who is the most likely to be the last one standing? Oh, Sam. I think Sam for sure. He's just so capable in so many different ways. He'd like work his life, kind of like send master into it and be able to dodge them and yeah, Sam. So this doesn't really happen in zombie movies, but I want to ask it anyway. Who is the most likely to get turned into a zombie, but then fight the change and come back at the last possible second to help save the day. Oh, that's so cool. I wish that would have been me. <laughs> Who could that be? Um, maybe Caroline, Caroline Henderson, you know, plays Yal Hokan. She would just refuse to be a zombie and then come back and be like the savior of us all. Hello everyone, welcome back to Collider Ladies Night. I'm so excited to get to introduce you to my latest obsession right now. It's Vikings Valhalla, and I have one of the stars here, Frida Gustafsson. I already said this to you before we started recording, but oh my God, I love the show. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. That's so exciting. It makes me so happy to hear. So usually I start by asking someone for, you know, the movie, the performance, personal experience that first made them say, I want to be an actor. But I know your first step in the entertainment industry, I guess, was modeling. And I don't know all that much about that end of the industry. So some of these questions might feel ill-informed, but I guess let's start with what inspired you to get into that line of work to begin with. Absolutely. Um, so for me, um, I was like a little theater monkey child. I come from like a working class family in like a suburb outside of Stockholm. And I've always just, you know, loved performing and being in front of people. So when I was little, I was acting and, you know, I was in theater classes. And um, then like pre-puberty, I went from being this, this like little small child to um, being incredibly tall, like a stick figure. And um, I kind of had a hard time with that. I didn't feel comfortable in my own body. I, you know, like all the girls had boobs in school and I was just straight and I didn't feel very good about myself. So I kind of lost my confidence and, you know, to go up in front of people and be like, look at me. And by like, you know, some kind of divine intervention, someone had a plan for me to, you know, deal with all of that. So I was scouted uh, eating meatballs at Ikea <laughs> the most Swedish thing ever. And when they first come up to me, they're like, oh, do you want to be a model? I was like, you know, choking on my meatball going, what? Um, so I, you know, I spoke to my dad who was there with me and we said, you know, it might be a good thing for me to, you know, try to break out of my shell a little bit and, you know, get more comfortable with myself. And then that just kind of 
took off way more than I ever expected or, you know, could even have dreamt of. So yeah, it's on that road. Wikipedia informs me that you took a, I think it said a five-year modeling break. Why did you take that break and was it to pursue acting? For me, the end goal was, you know, always, I've always wanted to act. It's what I've you know, I've always had that feeling inside of me that I was like, this is the only thing I think I'm ever going to be truly good at. This is the only thing that I ever really want to pursue. Um, but I also have so much respect for the craft. And I think coming from a modeling background, sometimes people look at you in a certain way and maybe be difficult to be taken seriously sometimes. So I was very aware that it was it wasn't going to be an easy road transitioning into acting in the way that I wanted to act I didn't want to play like you know the girlfriend in the bikini or like which nothing wrong with those type of parts but it just wasn't what I wanted to do I had done that you know with my modeling career if you know I wanted to just you know be a sexual object for people to look at I would have stayed and it wasn't what I wanted so I took a leap of faith I you know I was quit at the top of my career. I moved back to Sweden. Um, I started doing like pre uh, drama school courses and it was hard. You know, I didn't have an agent and I couldn't get an agent. Nobody, you know, wants to work with a person who has never done anything before. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was a, a, an interesting couple of years where I felt like I learned so much um, about myself and the, the hard work that you need to put in to, to get somewhere in this industry. So with all those challenges breaking into acting, is there anything in particular that happened or a person that you met that made you think like, like I'm, I'm, it's never easy, but I'm here, I'm standing on solid ground and I have a real chance now. Well, I think it was just as soon as I really started dedicating myself to the work and doing like, you know, theater school and, you know, realizing that it was just there. There was something there. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't. It was a diamond in the rough, if I can use that expression, which sounds a bit silly to talk about yourself that way. But I felt like, yes, I, I have the tools. I need you know, to better equip myself to use those tools. You need to like fine tune the instrument. And um, it was a really, really exciting feeling. I think for me, I'd spent so many years fulfilling other people's creative dreams. And to finally stand there yourself on a stage and working with text and be like, no, this is my viewpoint. This is what I want to say. This is my interpretation. For so many years, I had been stripped of, of that language where you just show up and you know, you're a vessel for someone else's ideas. So it was an incredibly empowering experience, although it didn't at first lead to any actual jobs. <laughs> I'm always a fan of teeny tiny details, things that are, you know, maybe vital to the foundation of a character or a show, but might not make the biggest impression on screen. So was there anything about Viking culture that really struck you that maybe we don't see in the spotlight, but you hope that viewers take notice of? For me as a woman, I think... It's quite striking to see a, a world where women have so many, you know, opportunities to be in control over their own destinies. I think it's an interesting parallel when you look at Jarl Håkon and Freydis on one hand, and then you have Emma of Normandy in the Saxon world on the other side, who her entire life has just been seen as a piece of property that can be negotiated with and bought and, you know, sold almost. Um Women of the Viking era had a lot of autonomy over their own lives. They could marry if they wanted to. They could divorce. They could own property. They could be jarls. They could vote. They could speak up for themselves. And they you know, could make informed decisions. They could travel the world in a way that a lot of women... A lot of women today don't have these freedoms and these you know, opportunities. So I think that was something that I found really incredible. And unfortunately, it's not such a huge part of the show, but you still get a little bit of a sense of the freedoms of women that unfortunately have been lost throughout the last couple of centuries. Let's get into the story now for her specifically. One, one thing that I was wondering at the beginning was, was why now? Why do the Greenlanders decide that this right here is the right moment to go out and track down Freitas' attacker? That's a really good question. That's something that I've spoken to um, with the wonderful Sam Corlett, who plays Leif Erikson, who plays my brother. Um, you know, we grow up in this very small, tight-knit community, and I guess it's a, it took time, the way we talked about it, it, took time to get, you know, a crew 
to come with us. You know, some of our younger cast members were maybe too young. I mean, we grew up in a place where, with only 40 people. It's not a lot of people. And you need a crew of at least eight to be able to row five weeks across the Atlantic. So that was one factor. And um, also to, uh, to get the permission of, of Eric to leave you know, the, our little settlement in shape enough that they're going to be able to survive. Because eight you know, people out of 42, that's, that's a, it's a lot of people that, that are going to go. And then I guess also, you know, for dramatic purposes, it's great that we arrive just when k- things are kicking off. So, <laughs> All right, I'm going to put the spoiler warning up for this next question so you could really talk about it freely. So in, in shows and, and uh, movies, I feel like I've heard countless times from characters, someone saying, you know, like revenge is pointless. It's going to wind up offering you no satisfaction. And if anything, it'll just like plunge you further into darkness. But that's not the case for Freitas. And I found that so interesting. So just why do you think for her that's not the case and she comes out of that mission stronger than ever? Well, for Freitas, I mean, she's a believer in the the old gods and in the old ways. And within Norse lawmaking, um, you were within your right to kill someone who had raped you. So it was a matter of very it's a very practical thing for her you know you do something to me i'm going to do this to you it's a matter of law it's a matter of you know reclaiming my 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 honor and my right in society so it comes from a very practical standpoint and then you know she meets harold who's a christian who is busy trying to make everyone you know like each other not judge each other too much and um it's it's an interesting dynamic you know with people who come up about it, like the great Olaf says, revenge is the motive of the heathens. Uh, yeah, it is. Episode five, the uh, the Uppsala part. So after she goes through that ceremony and has that encounter with the seer, what is the biggest difference between the way you tackled the role before that and then after? That's a good question. Um, up until that point, you know, she's been on a on a quest, and everything's been kind of complex and vague and you know hidden behind shadows and for the first time all those things that Yal Hokam said you know about that she needs to find her destiny she needs to fulfill she has a bigger part to play all of a sudden it dawns on her that yeah maybe that's true and having seen her you know loved ones die for her being brutally murdered having you know been torn away from her brother Picking up that cloak is maybe not something that she feels incredibly excited to do, and it go, it's it's heavy work, and she is not she's not honestly that interested in being at in the forefront and going, oh look at me, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the one who saves all of us. There's a lot of survivor guilt involved, and um, she's really struggling with accepting that she may be this quote unquote chosen one. Okay, so then the next step is her, you know, kind of, I guess, picking up the sword and shield. Episode six just kind of blew my mind. And I need to now ask you how much of your own stunt work you're doing, because when she's taking that test, I mean, there are so many long shots with minimal cuts, and it looks to me like you are doing the large majority of the stunts yourself. So is that the case? And what was that training like? I was fortunate enough to work with the most incredible stunt crew, and we quickly realized that I was able to do it. We had to um, put in a lot of work. Um, but except for one takedown in the fight in episode three, I do everything else. I was supposed to do the takedown, but we did it. And then I slid and I got I fractured my elbow. So after that, I wasn't allowed to do the takedown again. Um, but apart from that, every single thing that you see, um, I have done with the wonderful work. Um, I have a wonderful double, Karin, who is a Swedish um, stunt performer who is excellent, who has been my rock and cried with me and bled with me. And when I've been on the ground and you're bleeding and you cracked your hand open, she's always been there to lift me up and just look at me and go, I know you can do it. We've put in the hours. Come on, let's do it. So I've had my, you know, like team Freitas and that was, yeah. We worked really, really well together and uh, it was hard work, but I'm very proud of the results. Again, huge congratulations. And thank you for yet another obsession to add to my list of 2022 shows that I just absolutely adore. 
Thank you so much. The pleasure was all mine. Um, thank you so much for having me.